Well, Chris asked me uh, to come tonight, and uh, he said I could talk about anything. So I <laughs> I picked my own topic, but um, I and I don't know that you have a format. Um, at all, so I'll just sort of start talking and ask questions, interrupt me at will, and uh, we'll see where it, where it goes. Um, one of the things that I study is um, the way that law and policies um, perpetuate, create and perpetuate inequality. Um, and I focus on um, criminal justice systems um, in part of my work, and that's what I wanted to focus on tonight. It's not always obvious. Uh, I mean, it is, I guess, when you think about it, but when you start to think about equality, the first thing you think of are the economic um, policies that are put into place. Um, but the criminal justice system is a big part of how this is perpetuated. Um, those at the um, bottom of the socioeconomic ladder are disproportionately, as you all know, um, minorities, women, children, and uh, women of color, of course, being on the lowest rung. But there's um, so many factors uh, that go into this. And so I'll take you back a little bit, uh, not too far, well, <laughs> we'll go back and forth. But um, beginning in the 1970s, um, and then with the vengeance in the 1980s, our criminal justice system rejected this um, notion that had been put in place in the progressive era and then again by uh, the new left in the um, uh, 1960s that really focused uh, the criminal justice system on rehabilitation and uh, treatment. It said, you know, it looked at the uh, causes of crime as sociological. It said the reason that people commit crimes are for all sorts of sociological reasons, poverty being among them, not the only cause. Um, but that it isn't um, a rational choice theory of crime causation that's perpetuating the problems that we have in the United States. So the rational choice theory is the idea that a person says, um, I'm going to benefit from committing this particular crime. Like, let's say I want a television. My television broke. I want a new one. I see one through this window. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I'm going to go take it. And let me see. What are the penalties that could happen to me? What's the chance that I'm going to get caught? If I do get caught, what's the chance that, you know, something bad will happen to me? And so you weigh those benefits and those possible harms, and then you make a decision. Okay, it doesn't look like anybody's home, there's no alarm system, there's nobody on the block, nobody will see me, I can get in and out, I'm going to take it. Or, this is a high visible area, you know, a chance that I'll get caught is really likely, so I'm not going to take it, right? So everybody who goes to commit a crime goes through that process. That's the theory, right? So the way to stop crime under that kind of a theory is to make a harsher penalty, right? You're more likely to get caught, and if you get caught, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. So then the benefit wouldn't outweigh the cost. But the reality is that almost no one goes through that kind of an analysis, right, before they commit a crime. Most people um, are committing crimes because they are, um, uh, have some sort of substance abuse problem. So they're stealing so that they can get money so that they can buy drugs, or they're living in dire poverty. They have no other options. They can't get an education. Or everybody around them, this is part of an underground economy. This is the way that they are in their life. <coughs> Almost no one goes through this kind of um, thought process of I'm going to weigh the benefits and the costs and make a decision. Who, can you think of anyone who does go through that kind of a analysis before they commit a crime? Yeah. The 1%. Yeah. yeah. Is that the white collar crime is the, are the people who are most likely to go through that analysis. Exactly. So those are the people who should have the harshest penalties, right? Because that would make sense. If they're going through that analysis, then make the penalties stronger. And we do just the opposite, right? The penalties that, of white collar crimes are the easiest, the softest kinds of penalties. They're much less likely to get caught. If they are, they're much less likely to be prosecuted. If they are prosecuted, they're much less likely to get any sort of a, a, a jail sentence. For the people who don't go through that process, the people who have sub substance abuse problems or, or who are living in poverty, those kinds of responses would be, obviously, to 
give them treatment, right, to help them uh, try to overcome their addictions, to give them job training, to get them um, an education, to get them a job, right, to put them in a position where the things that are causing the crime no longer exist. But our system doesn't do that. Uh, beginning, as I said, in the 1970s and then in the 1980s with a vengeance, we said, get tough on crime. And get tough on crime meant we're going to have harsher sentences, they're going to be longer, they're going to, we're going to put in, we're going to take away judicial discretion, right? We're not going to let judges let people off anymore. We're going to say you have a minimum mandatory sentence that you have to um, serve. Uh, that if you commit certain numbers of crimes, right, three strikes and you're out, and then you go to prison forever. And there's all kinds of stories um, in the literature that show people who um, have committed really minor uh, crimes on their third crime. One of the uh, uh, cases that I teach is um, uh, uh, Leandro Andretti, who was a man who had served uh, the military, had gone to war, had come home, from the war and was uh, had a, a drug problem. He became addicted to drugs. He had very little money um, and uh, you know had never committed any kind of violent crime. He all of his crimes, the two prior crimes, were theft for theft for not much money, right? For small things. So his third crime was that he went into Kmart and he stole uh, uh, six. Uh, kid, children's videotapes. It was November. He had some nieces and nephews. He didn't have any money to buy them Christmas presents, so he wanted to steal um, some videotapes to give them for Christmas. It was his third strike. In uh, He was in California. In California, your third strike doesn't have to be a felony. If you have two prior felony convictions, your third strike could be a misdemeanor. And he was sentenced to life in prison. Life in prison. A vet. Right? For stealing six videotapes. So, we, you know, these are the kinds of uh, consequences of, of these uh, types of, of policies. And um, we put them into place from the administration, uh, Congress, um, the courts, uh, the jails, the prisons, everybody's in on it, right? All of these um, uh, um, parts of the wheel um, help make the... Um, uh, jail population and the prison population skyrocket. Um, so there's lots of people that have talked about this, right, written about it for a long time. Um, Jeffrey Ryman is one of the uh, early uh, people to identify um, this um, uh, phenomenon. He wrote a book in the late 1970s called The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison. H have any of you read it? No? Okay. It's now in its ninth edition, right? The latest edition was just published last year. And the theories are still the same. They've only gotten stronger. He has more evidence now um, than he ever had. So Ryman argues that the real goal of the criminal justice system is not to reduce crime, but to maintain the image that crime is caused by poor people. Right? It's all about image. And his argument is that the criminal justice system's failure to reduce crime is its goal, because that benefits those people who are in power. He wants everybody from the middle class to be looking down, looking down at the people who are poor, looking down at the people who are causing crime, because then they won't look up, right? And the um, uh, rich get richer, the poor get prison, and it's uh, Jeffrey Ryman. Yeah, I mean, it was, he, I think the first edition was published in 1979, and I think the ninth edition was published in 2010, and it's uh, uh, going strong. So um, he broadcasts um, a really po potent ideological message to the American people that protects the powerful and the privileged, and therefore legitimates the social order with its poor-rich divide, and as I said, diverts public discontent and op opposition away from the rich um, and the powerful onto the poor and the powerless. Um, and it does this in part by making the crimes of the poor dangerous, right? The offenses of the rich are seen as benign. The total opposite, that because the 1%, their influence is so vast, it's just Their ridiculous. crimes affect huge amounts of people. Yeah. Right. But they're not portrayed that way, right? right. They're portrayed as, oh, these aren't real crimes, right? right? And the crimes of the poor stealing videotapes. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that will undo our society. And I mean, all of this has just been, you know, brought right before our eyes um, over the last couple of years. I mean, it's never so evident as it is now. Ryman's been making this argument, you know, for mm. but, a long time. Um, like the difference between, you know, getting a sentence for crack and, and you know, powder, 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 powder right. pain. Right, right. Right, and that's been reduced by the Obama administration a little bit, right? I mean, it's better now than it was, but not much. But it's still the same kinds of problems, mm -hmm. exactly. I, yeah. I don't recall the author, but the name of the book is uh, Smoke and Mirrors, and it's a history of the war on drugs. So, uh, that author writes that uh, powdered cocaine wasn't really considered much of a drug problem before, before crack came along. And, and, Pretty much regarded as a oh well that's just a few rich white kids. Yeah, because we were <laughs> <laughs> right. Our government was shipping it in. Right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. And so we're going to talk about that uh, some more in just a second. But um, uh, not only do they make the poor crimes of the poor seem more dangerous, they also then propose uh, prison as the consequence. Right, so they put more and more people. Um, in prison. And then they say, look at all these poor people in prison. That's proof of how dangerous they are, right? And, and this problem. How dangerous our society is. <laughs> yeah. And isn't prison also a business that in and of itself, if you get the people in there, you're providing long-term money Abs for yourself? And people Absolutely. People paid a dollar a day to labor, and I saw this somewhere today, and five dollars for a minute of a phone call? Oh, you know? right. Yeah, yeah. To the cost of toothpaste, you, yeah, everything while you're in prison. Industrial complex. Right, <laughs> but even more than that, and I think this might be part of what you're getting at, is um, the growth of privatization of prisons, right? Mm -hmm. And the more that we make this a, a private enterprise, then the conditions go down, they're harder to regulate, right? We have less oversight, and it's just for profit. And um, in states where you are having an explosion of private prisons, the prison companies are influencing legislation and pushing the third strike you're out kind of legislation right. so that they gain more people living in their prisons to for a lifetime. Yeah. Right, right. And Slave and they labor. come back. Right? Slave labor. Yeah, yeah. And it you know, there's there's historical roots for that, um, which I'll talk about in just a second as well. So um, Ryman argues that the role of the government in the uh, American criminal justice system is not to protect its citizens against crime, and never has been, right? even though it might pretend to, to, that it is. Um, but it's really to use the law, the courts, the legal actors, the prisons to keep the criminal population, to keep a large criminal population, and a population that consists primarily of poor people, before our eyes. Um, and he argues that this has been done piecemeal, I don't know if he if he's gotten stronger over the years. I haven't read the latest editions of his book. I, I, initially, he was a little uh, reluctant to say that this was a purposeful program, right? He argued more that it was um, it uh, came together piecemeal through programs and strategies that broadcast and perpetuated this version, but vision, but wasn't necessarily done, you know, as a conspiracy. He may have changed uh, that position a little bit um, as it's become more obvious and hasn't changed, right? Um, but he argues that um, all of these things, the media especially, newspapers, televisions now, of course, social media, um, uh, come together to persu persuade the American people that the real dangers that they face, again, come from below and not from above. Um, Studies have found that the crimes that poor people commit are more, um, are more likely to be crimes for which they are arrested, charged, convicted, sentenced, and for longer terms. And so part of it is the, the legislature and the way that they draft these laws, but the other part of it is, is that we don't provide the kinds of services that poor people need, right? If you can't afford an attorney, the chance that you're going to be convicted skyrockets. Um, and so that's another part of, of the problem. Um, so uh, there's a bias in determining um, what is a crime as well, not just among um, the economic policies of the 1%, but also the businesses that they run, right? What's pollution? 
-hmm. Is pollution a crime? Mm -hmm. Right? The healthcare industry, the things that doctors do, right, aren't considered crimes, even though they feel criminal to us, right, when they've been done to us. But we don't, uh, uh, we don't have laws that make those crimes. But we do have laws that make public order crimes criminal, right? We make things that have, there's no victim, right? Gambling, you know, drinking underage, you know, drug use, all of those things. We put these, we make those criminal when there are things, I mean, the, the, uh, these are all nonviolent things as well. Nonviolent, victimless crimes. Pot smoking is illegal, but money laundering through packs is not. Right. Uh, pot smoking is With illegal, but <laughs> nuclear bombs are not. I, I find, I, I've always found it very humorous that Illinois statutes specifically has to tell you that insurance is exempt from gambling statutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of says it is. Right, right. Hey, I'll bet you won't have an earthquake. Right. <laughs> well, you think about, I mean, the example I always like to use is uh, the Ford Pinto cases. I mean, these, the dates me shows how old I am, but <laughs> these were the cases where uh, when uh, it was in the um, 1980s and the, um, uh, we, you know, we have an energy crisis and so, you know, people need to buy small cars and there was this big push to buy small cars and so Ford didn't have a small car on the market. So it had this Pinto in design, so it hurried up the process of, of uh, creating this, finishing the design, getting it on the market and they, of course, cut a bunch of corners. So now the Ford Pinto's out there, people are buying it up because it's supposed to be smaller and better gas mileage and all of this, only there was a tragic flaw. And that was that the engine was um, in the back where if you got uh, just a, a fender bender, right, somebody just taps you, it doesn't have to be a bad accident, it, the car blows up. Didn't Ralph Nader write a book about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so, so they, Ford becomes aware of this problem after people start dying from being burned to death inside their car from, you know, these explosions. So they go to Ford and they say, hey, this car is, you know, flawed in its design and you need to recall it and, and fix it. And they decide, they did a calculation and they decided that no, economically, it would be better for them to leave the cars on the road, and then just pay out for the few people that died. That mm -hmm. died. Settle out of court with them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they made that involved. they made that decision, cold, calculated decision. So there was an accident um, in I think it was Indiana. I'm not sure, but I think it was Indiana, where this you know the flawed design of the car caused someone to die, and so the uh, pro uh, prosecutor in Indiana said, "I'm going to charge." Uh, these uh, people at Ford with uh, murder because at this point they knew, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they lost. They could not convict them, right? So who do we convict and who, uh, who, what crimes are crimes and, you know, um, who goes to prison? <laughs> I mean, I, ca I can't imagine a more blatant case, right? All right, so th now to get to what you all keep bringing up, the drug wars, right? Um, <laughs> Michelle Alexander um, has written a book called uh, The New Jim Crow. And oh, I brought it with me because there's a subtitle on it. I'll buy it. Um, the New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. And I know Chris has read it. <laughs> because I've I, written about it. <laughs> because I, oh, in the, for this? Hmm? You've written about it for this, or for no? The class? I've written about yeah. it in class. Yeah. So um, uh, I think that this is a, a follow-up. It sounds like to some of the uh, other. She's not the first one to write about the drug wars, um, but she is one of the later ones, and she really focuses on um, the uh, racial implications behind this system as well, right? Um, so she starts. Uh, off tracing the systems that have been instituted in American society from slavery forward to maintain a racial caste system. Um, it was in place at the founding, right? Slavery was um, alive and well um, when we uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence and when we passed our Constitution. Um, both of these documents grounded in principles of liberty and equality, and yet um, we have a racial caste system that's perpetuated um, to today. 
Um, she talked about, she talks, she sort of traces this history from slavery um, after um, uh, the Civil War when we're supposed to, you know, have abolished slavery and not have a caste system anymore and how quickly um, the, the moment of reconstruction that we had that actually tried to have some sort of uh, racial equality eroded away. Um, black codes were put in place in the South, um, and this convict lease system uh, was created. And W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about it uh, back um, at the time, turn, around the turn of the 20th century, um, and uh, um, others you know, have talked about it as well. And it, here it is, right? You have the South. They've lost their labor system, right? Their free labor system from the, those that they had enslaved. So now they need somehow to get a labor system back. All of the, the South is still dependent on an agricultural um, uh, market. And uh, so they pass vagrancy laws. They say if you aren't working, then you that's a crime. And they only enforce them against African Americans. And they put them in jail, and then they make the jail makes contracts with the plantation owners, right? To say, okay, you know, send us uh, the prisoners to do work for free <laughs> on our farms. So it's the convict lease system. It's slavery reenacted. Only now they're using the criminal justice system, right? Um, and uh, so that works for a while. Um, they're able to maintain that uh, um, uh, for quite a while. The other problem with Reconstruction, and a lot of people, again, have talked about this, is that they left all of the property in the hands of white uh, landowners, right? Wealthy white uh, men. And so there's no means to overcome um, you know, the poverty um, that most of these people were freed into, right? Um, so uh, then uh, you know, we have the system of segregation that develops, right? And it says, OK, well, if we can't have the black codes anymore, at least we can keep everyone separate. At least we can say, you know, you can't, uh, uh, based on your color, go to these schools, go to these restaurants, live in this part of town, work in these jobs, right? And as you know, I'm sure Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 pretty much constitutionalizes separate uh, but equal. Um, they say that the 14th Amendment allows for um, separate but equal to stand. And so, you know, finally, um, more than 50 years later, almost 60 years later, we have a Supreme Court decision that deconstitutionalizes separate but equal, Brown versus Board of Education, that says, no, separate is unequal. But then we can't seem to get that enforced, right? It takes forever um, for the courts. And, you know, arguably today, we still have segregated schools. There's very few schools, uh, certainly, um, uh, the better schools, right, that have um, a uh, uh, mixed population. Um, white flight has allowed um, uh, the separation within the schools to continue, even though it's not legal. And the ACLU right? will not talk about it either, so don't even try. <laughs> really? Try. No, they will not. And I've, I've called them and complained. Why aren't you pushing, um, you know, Brown versus Board of Education to be, you know, implemented. Yeah. Yeah. They just act like you're crazy. Yeah. You know, but clearly it's not. You're obviously right. Yeah. There is huge discrimination in the education system. No. <laughs> English, Espanol. Video mix number 25. Video mix numero 25. This time I want to talk especially about hashtag JCCVW, which I created some time ago, abbreviation for Justice, Court, Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Esta vez Quiero hablar especialmente sobre el tema hashtag JCCVW, que el hashtag que he creado hace algún tiempo, so, que, eh, y es la abreviación por eh, justicia, Justice Court Comedy in Virtual Worlds, eh, justicia, 
Comedia de Justicia en Mundos Virtuales. I made already several videos about this hashtag. Uh, ya he hecho varios videos sobre este hashtag. But this time, especially thinking of my last video, number 24, uh, Robot Ethics. Pero esta vez, especialmente pensando en mi último video, uh, video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, e Ética de Robots. First, I want to mention uh, the episode of Simpsons, Treehouse of Horror, number 13. Primero quiero men mencionar el, el, epi el episodio de Simpsons, número 13, Treehouse of Horror, número 13. Just a side note, it's uh, astonishing uh, now many years in Spanish TV uh, and at lunchtime and in the evening they are still showing about half an hour or more of uh, Simpsons, many years now. It's uh, asombroso. Um, ya muchos años que por el mediodía y también por la, por la noche enseñan por lo menos media hora de los Simpsons in uh, television Española. Did you hear of the term Simpsonology? Has oído de, del término Simpsonología? Oh, Simpson, Simpson, Simpsonology. Simpson, Simpsonology. Maybe I'll check out if it in Spanish. Simpsonología. Todavía no. Long story short, the moral of the this episode of The Simpsons, the animals have more ethics than humans. Resumiendo este episodio de Los Simpsons, uh, los animales tienen más ética que los humanos. Remember my last video number Video mix number 24, Robot Ethics, Cat Ethics. Recuerda mi uh, último video mix número 24, Robot Ethics, Ética de Robots and Cat Ethics, Ética de Gatos. And with a funny gif. GIF is abbreviation for Graphic Interchange Format. Y con un gracioso GIF. G-I-F. Maybe it's a little bit helpful, helpful to compare robot ethics and cat ethics. Tal vez uh, ayuda a comparar un poco el ética de robots y ética de gatos. Once I said to my mom, uh, talking with this person is like uh, teaching, teaching ethics to cats. Una vez he dicho a mi madre, mira, hablando con esa persona es como uh, enseñar ética a, a gatos. They just do what they want. Solo simp simplemente hacen lo que quieren. And the robots do what they are programmed to do. Y los robots hacen simplemente lo que están programados de hacer. The question is the responsibility. La cuestión es la responsabilidad. So in the end, you see, it's almost not controllable. Así que verás que al final no es controlable. But normal cats can never turn as evil as humans. Pero gatos normales nunca pueden volverse tan eh, malos, a 
hacer cosas tan malas como los humanos. Perversion, perversión, opposite land, el país de justo todo al revés. Copyright, copy prohibition. Copyright es más bien no un derecho de copiar, sino una prohibición de copia, copiar. Law of intellectual property. La ley de la propiedad intelectual. Especially because I like to produce video mix. I got very angry about the legal system and the perverse law of intellectual property which inhibits innovation and freedom of expression. Especialmente porque me gusta producir video mix, me enfadé con el sistema legal, en especialmente el especialmente la ley de la propiedad intelectual que inhibe la innovación y la libertad de expresión. And if you continue to think about the legal system, uh, you get more and more doubts. Y si continúas de pensar sobre el sistema legal, vas a tener más y más dudas. But still, you have, I think it's important to have a place to talk about ethics. Pero igualmente pienso que es importante de tener un lugar donde se hable sobre ética. That's the main motivation why I created hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy and Virtual Worlds. Es la motivación principal por la que he creado el hashtag JCCVW, Justice Card Comedy and Virtual Worlds, Justicia Comedia de justicia en mundos virtuales. Even on my main Twitter account, Planos Enigma, the cover picture, um, I've got written, Justice, who has the right to judge? Who is without sin, cast the first stone. Hasta en mi cuenta de Twitter principal, Vanos Enigma, tengo el, el cover, la imagen de cover, escrito justicia. ¿Quién tiene el derecho de juzgar? ¿Quién esté sin pecado que tire la primera piedra? And it's astonishing how often the Simpsons show some kind of court comedies. Y es asombroso cuántas veces en los Simpsons enseñan algún tipo de comedias de juicios. I want to remember especially the lawsuit or court comedy of Homer Simpson when he sold his soul to the devil, Ned Flanders. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Homer Simpson cuando vendió su alma al diablo, uh, Ned Flanders. En normal legal system, the question is always, is it legal or is it illegal? En el sistema legal, eh, normalmente la cuestión pregunta es, ¿es legal o es ilegal? But it's more important to ask, is it, is it ethical, is it right or is it wrong? Es más importante preguntar, es, ¿está bien o mal? ¿Es ético? No, no es ético. 
did you hear of the term jury nullification? Has oído de este término ahora no sé en español, pero eh, uno tiene el derecho de decir que, por ejemplo, no culpable porque la ley es injusta. You have the right to say it's uh, not guilty because the law is not just unjust. I want to remember especially the case of Ross Albrecht, Free Ross, hashtag Free Ross, Dread Pirate, Silk Road. Especialmente quiero recordar el juicio de Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road, Bitcoin, and my profile picture of Innocent Crypto Kitty y mi imagen de perfil Innocent Crypto Kitty que quiere decir el, el gatito inocente de criptografía. But it's medical catnip. Pero es catnip médico. 30 years of jail for running a website which other people used for buying and selling catnip. 30 años de cárcel por hacer una página web que otras personas han usado para comprar y vender catnip. And I want to remember what uh, said Roger Ware, uh, Bitcoin Jesus. He said something like, uh, the war against drugs cause more harm than the drugs themselves. Y quiero recordar lo que dijo Roger Ware, que es como el Bitcoin, el Jesús de Bitcoin. Dijo algo como que la guerra contra las drogas causan más daño que las drogas mismas. Okay, let's go back to even if you would have want to have a person like ah and not just Roger Ware, uh, the case of Charlie Shrin, another Bitcoiner. A very interesting case too and one interview um, I made a video um, very interesting comment of Andreas Antonopoulos in one episode of Let's Talk Bitcoin I think it's the video mix number Yes, I had just a look. It's video mix number 17. El posto de mirada es el video mix número 17 uh, con Charlie Shrem. Uh, this comment I like too much, so I will paste it. Just paste it here. Este comentario me gusta demasiado, así que uh, algunos minutos voy a pegar. Este momento. And, uh, podcast can agree to the fact that whatever we have in this country that passes for a justice system has at least three tiers. There are, you know, uh, people at the top who get infinite, infinite forgiveness for some of the most disgusting mega crimes and never face the tiniest consequence for their actions. You can put a million people out of their homes with fraudulent foreclosures. And you'll never see the inside of a courtroom. You can rig markets, steal money from investors, defraud millions of people. You'll never see the inside of a courtroom. And yet... There's the other side of the scale where you have a situation of zero tolerance, where the slightest infraction, selling a loose cigarette for 
30 cents gets you a street side arrest judgment and execution by strangulation where jaywalking gets you shot by a cop even if you're unarmed and where cities run effectively debtors prisons where they rotate people through there for traffic fines and keep accumulating them until they end up in jail for violating subpoenas and things like that and run it as a for-profit enterprise and then in the middle is the middle class caught in this justice system this thin layer that's getting thinner all the time because they're getting squeezed from the bottom and the middle class sees the top of this country getting away with uh, mega crimes and sees a wave of zero tolerance coming at them that used to only affect minorities but now is increasingly taking bites out of the middle class and they're struggling desperately not to fall into this Orwellian zero tolerance justice system. That's not justice. I think everyone on this call probably has a similar perspective to this, but effectively what we're talking about is an erosion of the rule of law. And the most fundamental concept of the rule of law is equality in judgment. If a law exists, there is one tier. Everybody faces the same consequences for breaking that law. And that fundamental social compact has been violated. And for some stratum of the society, it never really existed. You know, Some people were always going to feel the heavy boot of law um, with no recourse and um, suffered under that for 200 years. Uh, but now that is increasingly becoming the vast majority of the population. So you live in a society where the slightest mistake is very harshly punished. That's if you survive the police encounter. Um, while you watch a country's so-called elite just roll from scandal to scandal, from crime to crime with no one going to jail. War crimes, no jail time. Bank fraud, no jail time. All of these things, you know, surveillance and violating the constitutional rights of millions of people, not even a misdemeanor issue. It just gets legalized after the fact. Lying to Congress, no problem. And then Preet can promote his resume by going after Charlie. It's really a disgusting situation, but I think it's, it's a situation that has nothing to do with Bitcoin per se. It's just a universal collapse of justice and the rule of law in this country. One of the few countries that actually had it. As that was so well said, I have no response to it. I, I completely agree with Andreas, everything he just said. It's 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 not limited to, to Bitcoin. It's a, it's an overall you see it you see it with everything. I mean look at the case of Aaron Schwartz. May he rest in peace, but once they have their sights on you, telling it's you per se, I think it's what you represent or who you are. Um, there's no getting out of those sites. And the higher up you are, the harder it is for them to prosecute you. It just doesn't make sense for them. Our justice system has been corrupted or skewed to, to, to what it is today. And I created the hashtag Let's Talk Justice, or maybe a better hashtag Let's Talk Ethics. Y también he creado ese hashtag Vamos a hablar sobre justicia, Let's Talk Justice, pero tal vez mejor Let's Talk Ethics, Vamos a hablar sobre ética. After this part of video mix number 17, I will paste a short video comparison of the two uh, websites of Wikipedia about this episode of Simpson Treehouse of Horror number 13. 
Y después de esa parte del video mix número 17 voy a pegar un pequeño video en una comparación entre las dos páginas de Wikipedia en inglés, en español. I forgot to say in English, in comparison between English and Spanish of the episode of The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror, no, eh, perdón, español ahora, eh, comparación del episodio de Simpsons Treehouse of Horror número 13. Comparing hashtag JCCVW to uh, the real legal system, of course, there is no such thing like judgment, rather a fiction punishment. Comparando JCCVW, uh, comparándolo con el sistema legal, uh, por supuesto no hay tal cosa como un, una sentencia de juicio, más bien un, un castigo ficticio. Just want to remember you, I have that uh, Twitter account Soul Trade Game in virtual worlds like Second Life with, with Virtual Guide Dog. Uh, recordar que tengo la cuenta en Twitter que se llama Soul Trade Game, traducido Juego de Negocios de Almas. Es como un juego en mundos virtuales como Second Life. Especially interesting for cats and blind people. Especialmente interesante para gatos y personas que estén ciegos o tengan problemas con los ojos. O people blind o people who have problems with the eyes. The bra. Anyway, watch my videos about Soul Trade Game. De toda forma, mirad mis videos sobre Soul Trade Game, juego de negocio de almas. And I have that Twitter account, Soul, uh, sorry, Soul Confiscator Catch. Y tengo este, esta cuenta de Twitter, Soul Confiscator Cat. You are welcome on all of my Twitter accounts. Normally I follow back. Estáis bienvenidos en todas mis cuentas de Twitter. Normalmente sigo de vuelta. So you see I have a double or triple interest to open hashtag JCCVW. Así que... Veis que tengo un doble o triple interés de abrir el hashtag JCCVW, Justice God Comedy in Virtual Worlds. Ah, what I wanted to say before about the jury nullification. Uh, if you really would like to, to um, participate in... Uh, trial, lawsuit, uh, to help uh, somebody from getting declared guilty fast, you have to take vacation, you have to buy a flight to New York, and I think this trial was in January of um, Free Ross, Ross Albrecht, um, Silk Road. So, bueno, lo que iba a decir antes uh, con respecto al derecho de uh, renalification en español no me acuerdo, so, no estoy segura, pero que tienes el derecho de decir que mira, yo estoy, uh, no estoy de acuerdo que esta persona sea declarada 
culpable. Así que primero tendrías que tomar vacaciones, comprar un vuelo a Nueva York. Y eh, era ese juicio, me parece, era en, en enero, cuando hizo un montón de frío. So comparing this legal system with uh, hashtag JCCVW, this is in, in, in virtual worlds. Everybody can participate and talk about ethics, right or wrong. Don't need to buy a flight to New York. Uh, comparando ahí con el sistema legal, no, eso tiene que tiene lugar en mundos virtuales, no hay que comprar un vuelo a Nueva York y tanto, tanto esfuerzo para participar en un juicio, discutir sobre ética. Puedes fácilmente participar en cualquier lugar, ordenador, P2P, and especially talking about robot ethics, this will be very important in the future. Y especialmente el tema de ética de robots en el futuro será muy importante. Because it's easy to say that the person who programmed the robot is responsible for the actions, but uh, it's very easy to uh, to hide the identity who programmed the robot. Es muy fácil decir que la persona que ha programado el robot es responsable por las acciones del robot, pero es muy fácil de ocultar la identidad de la persona que ha programado el robot. So now I'll paste the, these two videos. Así que ahora voy a pegar estos dos videos.
español, inglés, deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produziere ich nur videos in English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ya algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now already some weeks ago I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten uh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und Motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. 
eben Bitcoin-Adressen in Papier ausdrucken, ähm, wie die man sehen oder besser gleich 100, y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero. And the next time you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas, and for your friends, of course, und für deine Freunde natürlich, o tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante, or maybe a tip in a restaurant, oder trinkgeld im restaurant, bueno, a la hora de imprimir también, Copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die... Uh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Escribir la fecha más plus cuatro años eh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus, plus Four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre, ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin, eh, en estos cuatro años yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in, this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. Und dann erklärst du den Leuten, schau, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin-Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. 
this way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. En mi video antiguo he explicado uh, cómo he tomado la decisión de los cuatro años. In my old video I explained how I made the decision for the four years. In meinem original video habe ich erklärt, wie ich zu die Entscheidung getroffen habe uh, mit den vier Jahren. A continuación voy a pegar este video. Now later I will paste this video. Im Anschluss werde ich diesen Video ankleben. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy económico. Uh, at the moment the price of Bitcoin is very cheap. Pero casi todo el mundo tiene muy poco dinero para invertir. But almost everybody has a very little money to invest. Debería decir que esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's a rather a game. Um, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key. For example, uh, blockchain.info. Por ejemplo, la empresa blockchain.info. Luego, imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo. Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, 
and for your friends of course eso da motivación a la gente para aprender bitcoin y this gives motivation for the people to learn about bitcoin y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente and the game part uh, consists in the following explicas a la gente mira esta es la cl clave privada que es la clave secreta you explain to the people look this is the private key which must be secret and uh, you have it and uh, me and uh, explicas esa persona y yo mismo la tiene y antes pensaba en cinco años pero luego cambia un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años first i thought of five years but then i changed uh, my opinion to four years later explain Después lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction if uh, you don't do it uh, i do it after these four years so you lose this that's the this part of the game as uh, la parte del juego he creado este hashtag uh, btc4 para hacerlo un poco popular I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpson la gente tiene cuatro dedos. Y Solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in The Simpsons, people have four fingers and only God has five fingers. Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunos imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde puede ser de gran ayuda even if you just put a little small amount later it can be big help uh, no solo para bueno es un juego <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años para es para esta persona si no es para ti si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada so uh, it's this is the game part if uh, the, the person takes the money out it's for that person but if they forget it after these four years you can take it out and it can be really 
Bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada. Y si, por ejemplo, ok, first translate. Print not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente. Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta. Das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some bitcoin and you and this person doesn't have, have any so you have already this public address where they can send you bitcoin